This is The Second Studio, hosted by two architects, myself, David Lee, and a Marina Board, Deronay. This week is the two of us in another After Hours conversation. We've done like four After Hours conversations back to back. No, that's not true. I take it back. We did a fellow designer recently, which was mm-hmm. pre-recorded really like a, like uh, a long time ago, so I forgot about you it. You don't have to say all the secrets so, behind the <clears> scenes, you know? This week, we are talking about our recent trip to Switzerland, which was uh, initiated by the window company Skyframe. And we're going to talk about that as well in the recording. And that's basically... So if you don't, if you hate the Swiss... <laughs> and this I don't know anyone who does, This though, recording's but... not for you. Okay. Sponsors. <laughs> Are you tired of juggling multiple pieces of software and struggling with spreadsheets that aren't made for the realities of design and architecture in 2023? Built by and for designers and architects, Programmer's all-in-one suite of tools has everything modern studios need for every stage of a project. Mood boards, the world's best specification tools, procurement tracking, project management, and more. All smartly integrated and easily shareable and always up to date, reducing time-consuming double handling and costly errors. Share work in various formats from PDFs to client-friendly, up-to-date online dashboards. Join the ranks of leading studios using Programma today. Click the Programma link in our show notes to start for free. One of the easiest ways to get accurate existing conditions of houses is with an iPhone and iPad app called Canvas. Canvas is a tool we use on many of our projects. Instead of surveying the home manually, we simply scan it using our iPad, and Canvas processes the scan to produce accurate drawings and even 3D computer models. The file formats work with AutoCAD, ArchiCAD, Revit, Vectorworks, SketchUp, and others. It's extremely easy to use, really fast, and has been a huge benefit for us and our clients. Try it out by visiting cannabis.io forward slash SSP or click the link in our show notes to learn more. If you're still using AutoCAD and separate 3D modeling program, then let me just tell you, stop that. <laughs> Get with the times, people, and advance to a BIM computer program. The program we recommend is ARCHICAD. ARCHICAD leads the industry by enabling architecture and interior design firms around the world to 3D design. It's supported by innovative technology that expands as far as the imagination can stretch. As ARCHICAD continues to evolve with technological advances, architects can push that technology to their advantage while working in an accurate model. You can start your fully functioning free trial today by clicking the link in our episode notes. This is The Second Studio with the two of us. Here we go. Right, so... Went to Switzerland for a full week, right? Yeah. We were there, and we were very graciously hosted by Skyframe for the first two and a half or three-ish days. Skyframe, for anyone who, who doesn't know, they are a window and door manufacturing company based in Switzerland, which is where they have their headquarters and their factory. And they that part of, of the, the trip, uh, it was a tour hosted by them, and there was about seven different, I think seven of us? Six, six uh, of us? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, mostly architects, one contractor. And so they, they hosted all of us for three nights, two and a half days. And it was a lot of fun. During that time, we saw their factory, their headquarters. We saw some installations, like buildings where their products were installed. So all around good times. I mean, maybe people would be wondering what Skyframe, what they're about. Because I, I I do think that they're a good product, and for architects, listen, they could be. Yeah, no, they are a good product. They are also a, a very interesting company. Uh, we got to learn a little bit more about who they are as a company, and 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 meet some of the members when we were there. So it's always nice to kind of like put faces and mm-hmm. and a, a story behind a brand. Mm-hmm. You know, like oftentimes you use products and projects and. You have no idea like how big it is and who's behind and how it started and all of that. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. The quality is very good, as you might expect, from a Swiss, co- um, <laughs> from a Swiss company. Yeah. And, and I think we probably have touched on it when we had them on the show. Um, they also use glass, I think, from Germany. So yeah. they're very specific on the quality of where they source things and manufacture things, as you can imagine. So I don't know. I mean, if you have had some bad experience with, you know, window brands before, maybe you should look into them because you might find their system. Yeah, their MO is really frameless, right? So Fra- ultra minimal, yeah. thin profiles, all that stuff, motorized, sleek, high end, all the stuff that, you, that but, we would ever want. But what's interesting with them, too, is that they're very much on interested in having their product last in time. Yeah. And maybe that's more of a European mindset than an American mindset, let's say. Probably. Because you can retrofit their old windows with their new stuff, mm-hmm. which I found very very interesting. So um, there's a lot of good stuff about them. Um, 
it was really fun seeing seeing it you know like in person and how it's made i have to say the factory is super clean super clean yeah. I, at first i was like are they open today because it was lunch break when we went down you know to like look at stuff but they, you could have ate on the floor like it was yeah. so clean i'm like are they actually making things here everything was color coded and like super organized Ultra precise, and organized. very precise efficient i mean i was like this is a dream factory i want to i want to work here you know <laughs> yeah we when we first saw the fa so we visited the factory twice the first time we saw it was at lunch break when it was quiet mm -hmm. and that's sort of for not really safety reasons but not to disturb the workers yeah, yeah. right but <laughs> just have it was almost like but Where's the real factory? This must be a front, <laughs> right? This must be fake because it was so, so clean and so organized. Not maybe what you would expect from when you envision like a typical factory. Yeah. And I've been to other window manufacturers before and they're very high end and nice also. But this was, I mean, what, what you're, it, you're right. You could probably yeah. co eat, eat off the floor oh, and not yeah. have any problems. And then we actually came back later that day whilst things were in operation because someone from the group was asking, can we go back to the factory and see things in motion? And they are so efficient that they can operate this big facility with a relatively small number of people. What was also really fascinating is to hear how they operate as a company and how it's very different, I think, from um, some of the creative thinking that happens in the early design phases in an office. Like they, they were telling us about different methods they use to structure their business. So it's very, very organized, very efficient, and they keep track of everything so they can dial it in more and become just a little more efficient, you know, each day or each year. And that compiles over time. And um, <clears throat> it's not to say that an architecture or design office shouldn't be efficient or that we are inefficient, but it's just different, right? Because they're in a pro they're, it's a production yeah, company. Yeah, like production, we don't yeah. we're, we produce things, but everything we produce is completely different. So there's inherently and I've said this before inherently, frankly, a lot of quote inefficiencies in designing something because you're rethinking so much from scratch. Whereas for them, as a window manufacturer, they build on what they've done. You know, every day they build on a little bit, a little bit more and more and more. And and their employees are also interested in that. Like yeah. I remember, there was a, a portion in the factory where one of the person working at this specific station had come up with some sort of like gizmo to put on the table to basically help you know their fabrication work, which I thought was very interesting. So <clears throat> it was it was really cool to to see that basically throughout all the layers of the company. There is kind of like a mindset that everybody has toward it. Mm -hmm. um, the other interesting thing is that, you know, you could imagine that it's a factory. It's in Switzerland. It could just be like a warehouse with no windows and like super loud and like just cranking, you know, the orders in and out. And that's it. Right. And actually, their, their building was so cool. Yeah, so nice, interesting. Nice Huge amount of daylight. The factory did not feel a factory. It could have felt like a museum, honestly. And like, I don't know, it's just kind of like, it showed you that they care, again, to like, they care about all the levels uh, within their brands. And I think that just kind of like speaks for and itself. And we'll have to post some images of, of um, just a couple that we took of the factory and headquarters, which are in one mm -hmm. one building. But it's a big rectangle block. And it's, I don't know how many stories tall, like eight, ten stories tall. It's, it's no. quite, well, look at them counting the windows. Six 12 yeah, stories? It's a one story per. Uh, oh, no, that's true. So maybe like f <laughs> the iPhone distorts things. Four stories, five stories, whatever, five stories, let's say. Something like that, right? Uh, Three stories? Yeah, maybe like five. Well, it's also a factory story, which is like triple height. Yeah. But anyway, on one side of it, they have like this green facade that has um, vegetation outside of the glass. Yeah, pretty cool. And on the other side, it's, it's all glass. So you have this wonderful view of, of the Switzerland. Um, hillsides but anyway um so that that was interesting to to see for the building for the company and also they have you know large scale full mock-ups of a lot of their different products so you can go and mm -hmm. play test with them, them and test them out and see how they work and whatnot and some of the new things that they're experimenting with that we that we can't talk about but it is coming uh soon um and yeah it's just it was really cool to see the thinking that takes place with things like this and the tests they have to do for these window systems, you know, tens of thousands of cycles or whatever the crazy number was before they release a product. Yeah. Um, fascinatingly, <clears throat> we also talked about 
insulation and the sill details. This is like an architect's podcast, clearly. Sill details of their products. And they were remarking that they have two different versions. One is for the European... No. Well, one is for the European market and everywhere else in the world. And there's one detail that's specifically just for the United States because we do it differently here. And so we were speaking with the folks at Skyframe and the contractor and all the architects as part of our tour group, like the pros and cons of each of the installation methods. And it seems to me that the Euro, let's call it the European way of, of, of not just installation, but how, how the tracks and the silk plate and all that stuff comes together, seems to me the European method is far superior to the American method. Well, seems look, to me look, look. there is so, more history in what? building in uh, europe than, than here that's a fair point that's true you know so maybe that's where it comes from um but yeah it's kind <clears> of <throat> it's kind of interesting and like from a business standpoint too that you have to you know again like adapt what you create to work <clears> in different places and how much of that actually has to be so different from you know where you're from and where you're started i mean it's even if the way it's done in one place and everywhere else is better, and it makes just more sense. And that's got to be frustrating, too. I mean, we've experienced that when you do projects in other places. They're like, why would you use that material? Use this material. And you're like, what are you talking Like, you don't no. need CMU block for partition. That's crazy. Like, you just put some <laughs> studs up. We're, in we're inside. We don't need CMU block. You know, we don't need to coat the CMU block with plywood. That's mental. Like, we're just, <laughs> what? This is a family of four. You know, in an apartment. Well, what happens <laughs> if the if if you take a knife to the wall or the kids punch the wall or run into the wall? Well, well no one's going to take a switchblade to the wall. How about you that? You have more like, problem don't than the walls that. if that's where your family is. <clears throat> so, um, <coughs> yeah, that was that was pretty interesting. <clears throat> um, yeah, it was pretty cool. But kind of going through the trip. So if the first night we get there, okay. The other thing too is flying. I feel like when I was a little kid, long flights they took forever. Forever. It's like you're on the plane for days when you're a little kid. And then you get older and you're like, boom, six hour flight, nothing. Easy. No problems at all. Somehow I've gotten to an age now where I've gone, I've reversed. <laughs> so now even short flights feel painful. I'd forgotten being on the West Coast now that getting to Switzerland took almost 11 hours to get there yeah. and took basically 12 hours to get back. Well, direct, thankfully. That's a long fucking flight. Well, and it's just That's a brutal. flight time too. Like you get the three hours before, the two hours after, and then this and that. It adds up quite a bit. I think that's it's one of the things I miss from living on the East Coast is that you could hop over to Europe and six hours, or to the West Coast. It's about the same in yeah, the flying distance, which is insane. Um, so show up, feel disgusting, feel jet lagged. <laughs> And then there's, I think it's title CSO picked us up, which I was like, this is embarrassing. <laughs> High end window manufacturer picking us up from the airport. I look ragged. I'm like here, here's my sweatpants and my Crocs. Hey, how's it going? There's like Cheeto dust in my shirt. Oh yeah, <laughs> let's talk about windows. Uh, as we get to the hotel, we have like half an hour to fresh up. Then we go to dinner, which was great. Um, and I didn't know, but the place we had dinner at was the. The uh, the 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 house this house I think yeah of Goethe the philosopher uh, I don't know how you pronounce it but we yeah. always pronounce it Goethe there's no R Goethe I don't know I can't it's well the French pronunciation is goat G goat 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 G O E wait where's the, the philosopher pronounce? yeah it's G O E T H E yeah we always call it Goethe <laughs> I don't know <laughs> that's made a pronunciation maybe I made that up. But anyway, so the building was really cool because it was historic. The food was, that might have been one of the best meals we had oh, on the first good. night. Yeah, it was yeah. delicious. Felt great meeting everybody. I will say the last half hour, I crashed really hard. That cliff, I was approaching that cliff and went right off of it. I shut down. <laughs> I was like, I have to go uh, to bed. I have to say, I was pushing my boundaries. <laughs> I was, uh, there, there, there is a state when you're <clears throat> tired plus jet lag. I feel like when you once you pass it, it, you've entered another dimension. Like, you actually do not know anymore... What's going on. What is going on? Yeah. Are you supposed to be tired? Are you going to be able to sleep? Are you hungry? Or do you just need to throw up? Like, it's, <laughs> it's very it's very confusing. <laughs> I know, I know. And everyone was jet-lagged, obviously. But the thing I don't understand with the jet-lag is, you know, they're n uh, nine hours ahead of mm -hmm. California time. So, 
You would think, therefore, when you go to sleep, you're exhausted because it's basically you've done more than an all-nighter. But then when you wake up in the morning, you're going to wake up late, if anything, because when you wake up at, let's say, 8 o'clock in the morning, that's 5 p.m. on the West Coast. Oh, wait, no, is that? No, no, sorry. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. It will be 11 p.m. on the West Coast, right? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not doing the math, but yeah, sure. Okay, so when you wake up at 8 a.m. in Switzerland, it's actually 11 p.m. for us. So you think that if you had to wake up in the morning, you would wake up like late in the day. All of us woke up at like four o'clock in the morning after going to bed at 10 p.m. for no reason. It was so dumb to wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Why am I awake at four o'clock? This makes no sense. I've I've always find it more difficult to fly to Europe than fly back from Europe. Yeah. And on top of that, flying a red (laughs) eye, I think also just makes it worse because unless you can sleep in the plane, like it just accumulates and you really get your, your cycles messed up. Yeah, that was brutal. But it was good that we arrived in the late afternoon, early yeah, evening, was... because you just do dinner, then you go to bed. Yeah. And then it was good that we had a schedule, so the next day you're forced to wake up and kind of try and get into the rhythm of yeah. the place. I, I will also say they do a very good job of hosting. There was a lot of wine, a lot of espresso or coffee, and a lot of food, and just a lot of fun. And then on the second day, we got to see, um, go on a little architecture tour. Yeah, and the second Which, day we actually uh, shuttled over to Zurich because the factory is kind of like off in the countryside, but I, don't, I forgot it was maybe like what, half an hour away from Zurich, so like pretty that, close. Yeah. Um, and they had booked uh, uh, an architect who, uh, I don't know if she's retired or not, who just kind of like gives an like architecture tour. Mm-hmm. So we got to tour a few buildings and, and neighborhoods of Zurich. Mm-hmm. Um, the first one being, I don't know if it was like some sort of, uh, uh, what, what do you call it, like newspaper building or media office. Oh, the Sugar Raban building? Yeah. I don't know. It felt like an office building. I think it was some sort of newspaper or magazine or something. I think it was some sort of publication mag- um, building. Um, done by Shiger Ruban, but it was actually a building that was done, I think, like 10 years ago. It was nothing new. Yeah, it was um, done a while ago. That was pretty cool. Um, yeah, and by the way, so uh, if you're listening to this and you don't follow us on Instagram, one of the things, one of the reasons to follow us or just check these videos out, you don't have to follow us. Uh, so we posted a handful of videos of, of the Shiger Ruban building and some images and some other things of Zurich as well. Just fun We've been advised by many people who have successful, more successful, call it media companies, let's say, and like you guys should do more on-site, you know, stuff. And the problem with that is, as an aside, is that hey, we don't go anywhere. We just work. We work constantly. And you know, when if we're... you pay me to travel <clears throat> the world and do that, I I do it. <laughs> no problem. No problem. And a lot of the days, you know, the, the podcast and recordings are fun, but when we're out on sites or whatever, we don't, I don't. Per, to be honest, I don't feel like doing a recording. I just want to just exist in the world and, and not be recording all the time. That said, on this trip... Well, you kind of want to be present. I feel like sometimes when you're like too much on your device, if I it's agree. an iPhone or a camera, you're so just that, not that's present. The other thing, too, that's funny is that you know we have the podcast, we have the Instagram, which has a good following, um, and whatever else. So it's maybe one assumes that we're more interested in engaging in in people through those I, to be honest i'm not i like the podcast i like the little reels we do but being on my phone all the time recording stuff no, I just I, it's not I, in I, me i, I don't you know, i don't I like it but <laughs> this, despite so you have to watch yourself and now if we publish those videos from the trip i have to just see myself every time i go on instagram I'm like oh god are you going to unfollow your own show? <laughs> I, <laughs> Mute. I, 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 Block. I, I don't want to see that's these people. A good suggestion. Um, so we made a few that were just more for fun, nothing serious. But so on that architecture tour trip, I did want to ask you in a more uh, long form and serious manner. We saw the Sugar Raban building. What were your thoughts? Uh, we don't have to talk about all the buildings individually, but what did you think of the Sugar Raban building? Oh, yeah, having problems today. Yeah. Um, I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, I, I, we, we couldn't go past the lobby, so I wish we could have gone up and around and, you know, spend more time. Um, there is something that's very comforting and charming with, um, you know, timber structure mm-hmm. in general. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of interesting, the juxtaposition of like a modern glass facade next to like a, a timber framing. Um, Mass timber framing. Yeah, structure. Yeah. 
um, because you oftentimes don't see them like that, uh, especially when the facade is all glass, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, aluminum. and, and aluminum. And then you, you kind of, I, I, I don't know, I thought like the, the, the juxtaposition of the two was very interesting. Um, the details were pretty cool. I mean, again, we talked about who's the structural engineer who like designed those details because, you know, they're pretty pretty neat. There was an interesting use of, of the flooring with um, like river stone that they, they use as terrazzo, which after walking around during that day, we came to find is kind of like a local thing mm. um, that people do. In, yeah, we've seen that in multiple buildings. Oh, okay. um, so that was pretty cool. Didn't you know, notice. kind of like... It's interesting when you meander in a place you don't know and you notice things that repeat and you're like, oh, that's kind of like what they do here. And it would have been cool to maybe get some story about when did that started? Why is that the thing? Mm -hmm. um, the building was cool. Yeah, the facade from the exterior is, is nothing special, to be honest. But uh, The mass timber framing is the project. That's basically oh, yeah. no, that yeah. and the floor. Yeah. The rest of it's and, the, and actually the stair is quite nice too, but the rest is kind of... It's yeah. like whatever. The facade's whatever. The thing I didn't like, like about the interior space was the ceiling. They had these, uh, I assume they're yeah. acoustic panels, but they're not the same white as the rest of the ceiling. And they their layout seemed to be a bit arbitrary. And it reminded me of the kind of a tortoise um, shell. I don't have a good mm. picture of it. But yeah, so I, I've not seen... I've only seen one other project by Sugar Ruban. It was a very small project in, in the west side, uh, in West Village or Soho, the um, camper store that had the cardboard tubes uh, roof. That was done by oh, Sugar Ruban, or nice. at least the roof does. I don't know if I saw that. And that's not really, it's just a you know rectangle because it's yeah. a small shop. But it makes me wonder, you know, I, I think like being really good at producing interesting details and a structural system is one thing but then being able to see it through all the way with everything else is a different thing and i'm not saying that this is a critique of sugar Ruban, his work or his office or him specifically i'm saying in general like i have seen that before right where there are architects designers or students who are really good at very specific moments but like when you look at the big picture it's like oh it's all right yeah, no, I mean, uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, for sure. For Did not sure. like the ceiling. And then the rest of the tour was mostly just walking around and then sightseeing from the outside, um, mostly modern buildings in Zurich. And unfortunately on the tour, we didn't get to see the historic side. Later on on the trip, uh, we did, which was also great. And I said, as I said in the videos on Instagram, I was, I was surprised by the, the rigidity of the types of buildings in the more contemporary I side wasn't. of Zurich, like just <clears throat> grids, like just relentless. Gr every building has to be a grid. And at most you have a grid that's shifted, but that's like one. You can only do it once. Everything else, just a grid. And it was a bit, um, it was a bit overwhelming. I guess I'm, I'm used, I'm a bit more used to just overwelming uh, or overwhelming. It kind of depends. <laughs> well, sure. But you know, it's just like a lot of grid. I'm like, where's the relief? Like, we don't need grids everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of, of randomness, but I'm like, you could throw in a little whack, some, some wacky stuff here. Like where, where's where the fun? The, where's the, just anything, but just grids, you know? Yeah. So I don't know if that's like a, you're, and they also use glass block a lot, which, seems to be over th in that country uh, considered more contemporary or more acceptable by like you know if we're talking about trends but certainly glass block to a lot of americans feels outdated it feels like something from you know the whatever 60s or era <clears throat> yeah it's interesting the glass block i mean I've, i haven't seen it in france growing up a whole bunch um, maybe it didn't have as much of a breakthrough in France as it did maybe in Germany or Switzerland or other places. Um, yeah, the glass block was interesting. The you know the modern building being grids. I have to say I don't think Europe is necessarily the best place for modern architecture. At least cent like Central Europe. I don't know about the northern countries. I'm sure they do like a much better job at, at those buildings. But I feel like. You know, in general, French buildings, mm -hmm. let's say in Paris, where they're modern, they're just kind of clunky and not yeah. particularly elegant. And it's a bit unfair if you compare them to the Osmanian buildings because of all of the details that those have. But there is also, I think, a lack of history and designing and understanding modern architecture in Europe versus the U.S. And I would say if you're interested in modern architecture, like 
probably go to the US or even Asia. There's probably a lot more interesting stuff. I don't. I wouldn't. You know, go to France or Switzerland. But there are outliers, of course. Like of the course, there news. is outliers. But you know, like urban projects that yeah. are modern, they're usually so confined by zoning and context and budgets and markets. And are you talking you know, about buildings in Europe or buildings in the United in States Europe. or both? Uh, in well, in in, right, in Europe, because <clears> we're talking <throat> about Switzerland. I mean, you know, you could say like, well, New York has a lot of those constraints too. Yes, but I feel like. From our time and experience in New York, there is a lot of design thoughts and, and, and budgets and process that goes into detailing those facades so they're not just grids. Yeah. Um, you know, there's I, a lot of I, like smart systems and precast and mm -hmm. and because that is the only thing that that is what the building looks like and there is a lot of attention put on those. I feel like in Europe it's not so much the same. That's interesting. I, from what I know, I would tend to agree with that if we're making generalisms, right? I think a lot of the average American uh, architecture office that does a lot of these large scale office or even residential, you know, mid rise structures and it's and their modern or contemporary designs, they do a better job. And it's probably because there's been more practice. Like you said, the history yeah. of, of, of that type of building is there's been a lot more practice in the United States. Um, there, there, there is also more precedent, you know, like you yeah. do work like that in New York. There's so much around that yeah. you can look at those, critique those and, and design from there. Uh, when, you know, maybe in, it's in Zurich in that area, there wasn't a whole lot of precedence. There was um, a couple of buildings we saw that I thought were quite nice. Um, you know, simple, nothing, nothing like crazy, but still really, really nicely done. Like the, the one in the upper left with the shifted facade. I thought that was actually really well done. But um, a lot of them also were just, uh, to be honest, bad. They were not good. Um, and it's not just a different sensibility because I'm an American and now we're in a different country. So, you know, like I was saying, glass block. Like, I'm not saying it because I don't like glass block and that building had glass block. Therefore, it's bad design. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying just stick to pure pro pro proportions and the yeah, no, execution. Great. and the Like, it just it wasn't good. Um, an interesting detail that we noticed uh, that was talked about quite a bit is that it's really common in Switzerland and maybe other countries as well in Europe, probably, for um, architects and buildings to have exterior uh, blinds. Shutters, yes, yeah. obviously, the shutters that rotate but uh, or swing, but like blind systems, the ones that go up and down, but they're on the outside, and it's ultra common. It's another example of something if of a, of a detail, let's say, where if you try to do that in the United States... Can it be done? Of course, it's the same physics here, but would it be accepted by the client or the contractor or or anyone else, or would the they conjure up some reason why you can't do that? Oh, it's you know going to break down over time, maintenance and this and that, or it's going to get dirty, whatever other reasons or excuses. And I think it would get shut down most of the time, but and yet, well, f take a slightly long flight over to Switzerland. It's done. It's done everywhere, and they don't yeah, have any problems. Was, so I've, yeah, it can be done. Like, I actually had never seen that before. <clears throat> uh, that's definitely not a thing that is done in France. So that was very interesting. And yeah, most buildings had them, like apartment buildings, <laughs> hotels. Like it's kind of a common thing, which is wonder, interesting because they they help with shade, but they also like they close off completely at night too. So they also work as shutters. Mm -hmm. um, that was very interesting. The um. I wonder if it's an example of this is I'm, I'm making this up, but like anytime you talk about um, motorized systems like these exterior blind shutters, the first reason why it's going to get shut down is that, oh, the, what happens if the motor breaks? Right. That's everyone's concern. Um, and so I what, wonder you have motorized shade. You I know? What, yeah, I know. I wonder if there's something to do with the mindset of building in Europe being a more long lasting vision. Therefore, maybe the motors and things are built to be much more resilient so they don't break. Therefore, people feel less concerned about that. Like, literally, these motorized blinds are everywhere. So no one has a problem. I mean, with them. you know, if it's Swiss made or German made, the motor probably would never break. <laughs> so it's probably less now that you put it that way, yeah. Yeah. If it's in the US, it's going to be made in China and it's probably going to break after a week. So <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, maybe that <coughs> I don't know who knows, right? But it, maybe that's part of it. Um, we also saw a building that from what I understood, had a facade that had two layers of glass um, sealed 
right? So there's, there's the, the sealed cavity between them, and in that cavity were curtains, like fabric curtains that would open and close left to right. And um, the tour guide was talking about it. And, uh, I forget what she said, but I just I couldn't understand the well, benefit of that. that. Like it's an interesting thing, and in that I've never seen that before. But it seems pointless to me. Well, I think it probably was about maybe thermal performance, and on top of that, you know, you could have curtains in it. So I think she was saying that it doesn't get dusty; you don't have to clean them or whatever. And I was like, yeah, this seems a bit overkill, though. I mean, but that also gets to another thing in design, which is what elements are temporary versus not. You know, like we always talk about the layout of a building. The structure of building that that's like pretty permanent the windows are pretty permanent but things like curtains you know like fabric curtains um not not shutters like usually those are considered more temporary because styles and colors and palettes do change and curtains are typically like the first thing you would sw uh, swip, um, swap out in a building like you know 20 years from now <clears throat> like what was popular 20 years ago or 30 years ago is not the case it's not popular now yeah i don't know what you're looking at? Um, I'm looking at the double um, double skin facade because I think we saw another building that same day on like a, a plaza that was a school or whatever that also yep. had that. Yep. Uh, I mean, yeah, it just says that it, it improved thermal and acoustic yeah. performances. Um, it does. That's a lot of facade, though. It's a lot of facade. I mean, the street it's wasn't... It's double facade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> but the street wasn't particularly loud, and I don't know how cold it gets, but I don't think it could get that cold in Chicago, so... Also, if they're concerned with thermal performance, maybe don't turn on the heater everywhere we go <laughs> in June. I, I don't get that. Yeah, the, the, there's a difference for sure between the United States and a lot of European countries and also the United States and, and China, for example. AC is not really a big of a thing uh, in you Europe. Know, like I, it's just I, not... You don't. The buildings don't have AC. You know, I grew up in, in France and I grew up oh, without really? AC. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> Um, I grew up with that AC, and you know, when it's hot, you open the window, you have a fan, you dress more lightly, you drink more water, like you just find ways, right? You just make I would do. drink more water, except that we go to a restaurant <laughs> in Europe, they give you, give you a tiny. I was like, here's here's one quarter cup of or and you have one, to ask for it. Yeah. They don't automatically give you water, which I know. was puzzling to it's me. Like some but. warm glass that's been sitting outside out in the sun <laughs> next to the pigeons, and some warm water. What is this? Give me some ice, bro. I know, but I have to say, so I was used to, you know live without AC. Yeah. And I've been in the States now long enough that I'm used to live with some sort of AC or breeze or something, Just right? Movement. Just <laughs> airflow. Yeah. And I have to say, it's very uncomfortable when there is no air movement mm -hmm. or it's too hot. And I'm like... <clears throat> I, I don't know just put a, f a f put a fan like just do something there's no air moving and what was interesting is we went in June the weather wasn't particularly hot some of the days or sunny some of the days right there's maybe like the day we actually went to Zurich to do the tour was a little chilly but nothing yeah, cold was. the, like the you, morning was cold people were it, shaking <laughs> well yeah but you know you have like a lightweight jacket or you know like you're, you're okay like it's, yeah, yeah, it wasn't yeah. that bad the heater was on everywhere we Blasting. went yeah and I was like, I don't know. Maybe they're just like it hot in Switzerland. I'm not sure. I, I, it was too stuffy. A every time our tour group got in the van, and we had a dedicated little mini white van, white mini van. Every time we got in, the default for, I guess, Swiss people and the driver in this case was no AC, no nothing, windows up. It's fine. For us, like super stuffy. So every time we would get in, be like, I'm oh, sorry, could. Could you turn on the air conditioning? It's like, sure. And then next time we get in, uh, t could you turn on the air conditioning for us? <laughs> it's weird. How come like your, your, your thermal tolerance uh, I, I, you know, I, vary I, from culture to culture? It's very interesting. I like airflow in cars. and I like airflow. The only time I'm okay with no airflow is, is well, sometimes if I'm by myself, when I get in the car and it's a hot day, I like to sit in the car and drive, no AC, windows up. Oh, no. I don't know why. I don't know why. So some kind of weird, some kind of perverse thinking going on. I'm not quite sure, but I like it. I, I, it's, uh, maybe it's a it's a test to see how long I can last in the car before I pass I, out. I usually get car sick, so I need some sort of air source, either like, you know, the fan in the car or the windows down a little bit. Know. 
and I'm 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 much better if it's a little breezy than like too stuffy because I would get lightheaded. But some people you get in their cars and and it's like that though, right? They don't. There's no oh, air yeah. moving at all, and the windows are up, and you're just in this sealed box with four people mouth breathing, and I don't know. It's the first thing I do when I have guests. I fucking roll down all the windows. Let's get the air moving out here. I know. Out of here. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> we get to see a, a Calatrava um, building. I think it was, I think it was an addition to an existing yep. school of law. Yep, uh, that was pretty cool. I mean, very Calatrava esque, as you can imagine. Um, you know, well done. Uh, you know, another yeah. another thing that was surprising: there's only like one tiny bathroom on every floor, and uh, it was like right off of the elevator, which is kind of <laughs> the main kind of space surprising. was the. Again, I think we have some photographs on Instagram, but the main space is this big, um, not courtyard, what do you call it? Well, it's sort atrium? of a, yeah, atrium um, that's like, like six oval. stories tall, and all the desks are in the perimeter of this oval, you know, shape plan, and everyone looks, you know, kind of across to each other. Um, so that space is nice, and there's a lot of wood paneling and whatever, and you have the typical Calatrava roof that has a bunch of sculpted structural stuff that has fins that move and whatever and all that. that's all great but what was very odd like you said all the supportive spaces on the periphery of that like the bathroom was not it's like you I ran mean, out of square it, footage or it, like you it, could have sucked up more square feet from this atrium just to give like another foot would have helped like in the circulation where everyone's moving up and down on a very narrow uh, staircase that was like poor planners. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why it was that weird. Way. And I, I'm sure it probably had to do because they were dealing with an addition to an existing structure, and like Maybe. how the two are kind of like joining each other. Uh, it was a bit clunky to me, but but the, the main space was really cool. Although I don't, you know, the big atrium when you're down in it, mm -hmm. um, I feel like that space could be used for something. It just felt like a lot of square footage to. No purpose. It's just the beauty of space. Fine, it's not but all it's not about maximizing. You know, it's not a church. I mean, it's a church. Of the interesting thing is that you could not see any desk, any books, any heads, or anything when you were in that atrium. Yeah, just pure oh, architecture, oh, yeah. which is very interesting. Um, <laughs> interesting for architects. Interesting <laughs> for architects. Yeah. Get out of here! I don't want you in my photo. Oh, but they could have put some plants on the first level or something. <clears> you know, like just I don't know. I understand it. So much light, uh, but that was a pretty pretty cool building. And then we went to see the Pavillon Le Corbusier, which apparently, we were not sure when we went, because they didn't have, I think, any g guidebook or something in English. Mm. Um, but it was actually designed as a museum, as an art gallery, not oh. as a house. Uh, we were kind of like all wondering, like, is this a house? Like, what was that? It's very, very gallery. cool uh, building, as you can expect from Corbu. Um, it, it's, it's... <laughs> it just felt, you know, it felt like a giant... Playground for for adults, mm -hmm. for architects, yeah. um, and it just makes you wonder, like, what are we doing nowadays? You know, with all of the building codes restriction and like vanilla material palettes, and let's just satisfy everybody. Like, obviously, this I mean, this is a museum, so granted, fine. The program and the brief is a bit different, but you could imagine this is somebody's house, or it's a school, or it's a office building. And honestly, it could be anything, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how did how do we not do buildings that are more fun like the like this? I'd be curious as to know when this was done in his career. I presume by this point in time he was known as Le Corbusier, like he was a well-known, established architect, and you'd probably hire him at this point in his career. Do you hire Corbusier to get a Corbusier building? Like that's you know what you're getting. And um, but in response to what you said, I, I it was his last building actually. Oh, okay, his last building. Yeah, the last building he designed. Fascinating. Interesting. It is a very complex little piece of architecture. A lot of stuff is happening in a relatively small footprint. A lot of interesting things. So, um, but in response to what you were saying, I agree, and it makes me wish that architects were more hired for their expertise as that very specific and special architect for them to design something that's still for the client and fit to client and all that stuff, but is clearly authored by the architect rather than people hiring an architect who's, who, uh, who, 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 where, who they are is not very important to the client and the client saying, just, I want something that has 
X program and I want it to look sort of like like this, you know, beige and black windows or whatever. Like that's such a boring way to create anything. Um, what are you looking at? So I'm looking at the the history. So it was actually done in 1967. Recent. Um, and it's an art museum that is dedicated to his work, right? And the client had actually approached him in 1960, and she had the um, vision to establish a museum that was designed by him, right? Mm -hmm. And the building was intended to exhibit his work of art in an ideal environment created by himself. Okay, so so Maximum Corbusier. Yep. Gotcha. When did he die? Um, I'm not sure yet. For some reason, I thought he, I, I, I thought he might have passed in like the 1920s or something. But he used intense uh, prefabricated steel elements, uh -huh. multicolored enamel plate plates. Enamel, okay. Yeah, um, you know, concrete and stone. Yep. The roof Metal. is made of two square parts, and each side is a 12 by 12 meter, so 39 feet. Yeah. And it's welded metal sheet sheet panels. So expensive. So the other thing that having we, a weight of forty tons, f four zero tons. Yeah. Yeah. Ro so and the roof was prefab. It's very interesting. Yeah, uh, that kind of makes sense. Um, so the other thing that we were talking about on site uh, amongst ourselves and with the contractor who was there is <laughs> how much? <laughs> I mean, of course, the contractors hate this question. Right? I'm like, so how, how much do you think this would cost to build? And he's like, ah, oh, it's a tough question. Um, I forget what his guess was. I think it was like 12 or 17 million, something like that. I don't think he said over 20, but it was more than 10 for sure. He actually died in 1965. So he died before wow. the building was completed. That's Seven, really that's late. 77. I, 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 he was how old? 77. I guess that makes sense. It's not that old. Yeah. But Man, anyway. He could have seen it through. What the fuck? No, he got lost in the ocean. But anyway, um, so... You know, we talk about why aren't things like this built today, and one issue is, again, the expectations or the reasons why people hire architects in general. I'm not talking about the star architects. That's a different category or different tier, let's say. But just in general, when people hire designers and architects, there's a lot of this, you know, make it sort of like this because I feel comfortable with that thing, right? That's one problem. The other problem is just cost. Um, and, and then thirdly, building codes and whatnot. But just, you know, talking about cost... Like, it, let's just uh, guess for the moment that this would cost about $17 million to build today in California. And I think that's probably on the lower end, if anything, given all the custom details. Um, that's $17 million. Sometimes I think we get desensitized to these kinds of numbers because of what we're used yeah. to hearing and saying. But $17 million, like, that's a, a lot of money to spend on, on anything. And... That's also why it's hard to do projects that have this many custom cool components. A lot of it's prefab, yes, but there's a lot of custom things here for sure. And even if it was fabricated offsite, there were one offs. I mean, it's just expensive. And then you convince someone. So really, it that goes. It also gets to the, to the importance and the value of, of of clients. So now you're talking about a client who's ultra wealthy not just a little bit wealthy but ultra wealthy as willing to splurge on just cool random cool architecture and so be a patron basically of the arts is basically what it is that's not that many people so i'm not saying that's it's an not, excuse actually, but like, i feel like that's, there, there should be more people who do that i feel like it's a i mean it's a decent placement of your fortune you know, you're participating to building the culture and heritage of your country, <coughs> your state, your whatever, your background, you know. Like. People are way too self-centered to be thinking that way, though. Oh, But well, they do yeah. put it into real estate. But again, the money, the investments, like you buy art because you like the art because it's all, it is also an investment. You expect that artist to get better and, and become more famous and the value of the, the piece goes up and you make money in the end and whatever. The same thing happens with real estate, except... Excuse me. In real estate, the value of it has nothing to do with design. It's purely program and square footage and the amenities and what's popular about those things in this new region. That's it. Even when you get a construction loan, that's it. Like they don't give a shit about like how nice the space feels yeah. or how, you know, sculptural or artistic it is. Like the whole entire, the entire 
art side, the creative side of architecture and design uh, and, and for buildings, completely not in the in the conversation of how we value real estate generally in the United States. And it's super different from art in that regard. And it's... Um, but anyway, so it's in, it's interesting. <laughs> I think the the importance of like culture in a country, you know, yeah, a cultural building, cultural heritage. Like, um, I think there were a few places we went to in Switzerland that were part of like the UNESCO heritage, like yeah. that were classified as basically special gems, like special places and such. And I'm like, why isn't there more of these, you know, classifications or or um, let, let's say labels on some of those important places. Like I feel like they should be recognized in more. Europe? In Europe, well, in Europe there is a bunch. I mean, there, you know, like historical uh, oh. monuments. Historical classification is at least in France, like it's big. Like it, like it's it's it it shows value. Like if sure. your building gets classified as a historical building. Um, it adds value to it. Yeah. You know, uh, which I, I think it Wait, does here too. So are you asking too, why it doesn't happen more in, in the United States? Yeah, I mean, you can find it in the United States if, if you have like some old structure or some Native American structures or, or things like that, but like more modern <clears throat> or or um, or even non-necessarily, uh, you know, famous places, you know, like Marilyn Monroe's house in L.A. I think is getting classified as historical because of oh, Marilyn Monroe. I'm like, hmm. that's cool. I mean, in terms of architecture, I'm not sure the house is worth that. But, but you know, there is a lot of like really cool buildings and architecture that would probably deserve to get this this classification, either to protect them from disappearing or to claim to the other buildings around that this is an interesting building and it should be looked at and considered and uh, you know maybe studied Hmm. um rather than not because how else do you tell people what is good and what is bad what is important what is not important right (sighs) that's a whole no i know i'm not asking you to answer it that's a whole that's a difficult thing to to communicate or decide um and the people who are currently charged of making those decisions or voicing those opinions know nothing about architecture in general like design boards and whatnot And now a little break for our show sponsors. If you're starting to laser scan your renovation projects for accurate as-builts, you'll want to hear this. Imagine that you've been awarded a big project, but not surprisingly, your client hands over wonky CAD drawings from 17 years ago. No worries. Meet Integrated Projects, or IPX for short. IPX is a scan-to-BIM platform that converts your 3D point cloud file, which is produced from any major LiDAR camera, into standardized BIM and CAD files. The best part is that they lay out the price and turnaround time instantly. That means starting your interior renovation project on the 50-yard line with an accurate set of drawings in 3D and 2D. Click the IPX link in our show notes to launch the platform for free. We are supported by Enscape. Enscape is a fast and easy-to-use real-time visualization and VR tool for the AEC industry. Enscape is not a standalone application. Instead, it's a plugin, which makes things much easier. It plugs into Revit, SketchUp, Rhino, ArchiCAD, and Vectorworks. With Enscape, you can create realistic renderings, 360-degree panoramas and videos, and you can even immerse clients in VR to give them a deeper understanding of their building. Enscape is used by more than 500,000 monthly users worldwide from over 150 countries. So if you want a fast and user-friendly real-time visualization experience, then click on the Enscape 3D link in our show notes. The Second Studio Podcast is made possible by support from Autodesk. Autodesk has been part of a design conversation since 1982, providing the tools that help architects around the globe imagine and create beautifully designed, memorable buildings that people love and admire. Autodesk supports the work of the Second Studio, bringing the architecture community together, sparking curiosity, and leading vibrant interviews with the industry's visionaries and thought leaders. The Second Studio works hard to carry the architecture conversation forward, and Autodesk is proud to contribute to this podcast. If you want to learn more about Autodesk, click the link in the episode notes. The, the What is it called? The Kunst? The Kunsthaus. Uh, I'm probably butchering the name, uh, yeah. which is the extension of the modern art I have museum. No idea. Yeah. Uh, by David Schipperfield mm-hmm. in Zurich. Nice building. Um, very nice building. I must know, anyone listening, I must know, I must find out why in a few places in the building the marble tile seems to be laid out with intention and everywhere else it's random. So we have marble tile 
the tiles are maybe like two by two, three by three, I don't know, whatever they are. Then it's scattered throughout the entire museum, right? Random pattern, it feels like. But you have a center line that goes down the center of the building. And on that center line, like once or twice, there are two tiles that are almost perfectly symmetrical that are right next to each other like, and a butterfly. Like dark gray and dark gray, which stands out because it's mostly light, right? Everywhere else you have dark gray um, tiles kind of like r randomly. But in a few places, like right in the middle, there's two next to each other. And something like that happened again somewhere else in the pro. I must know why the fuck that's the case. Well, they so probably had someone, one guy who was setting up those tiles and maybe decided the to tile do his own installer thing. decided yeah to do his own thing, or he was smoking weed exactly, and thought exactly. it would be cool. Watch, Whatever. Exactly. Watch me. I'm <laughs> gonna put the tiles the way I Let want. Let me them. know why that's the case. Um, well, you gotta reach out to uh, David's office and uh, find out who's the tile guy. So, and... David, why? Yeah, but the rest of the building was nice. It was Simple, nice. yeah, elegant, it was nice. good details, restrained palette, fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was nice. Some like nice, <clears throat> nice modern detail. You know, some brass here and there that was pretty cool. Uh, definitely got to see some pretty cool paintings, so that was nice. We got to see one of the most famous famous paintings by Monet, and we got to see Vincent Van Gogh's self portrait. And I don't know the name of the 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 painting. The one there was a is it a farmer, some kind of agriculture guy. Mm -hmm. That's not himself also, is it? He has like a straw hat of some kind. I don't think that's him. And then, yeah, his self-portrait. I uh, And um, who was this artist? I forget. But those two and another artist, which I'm, I can't remember their name, um, I probably spent more time than I ever have just staring at those works of art. Um, it was also nice because the museum was not busy. You know when That's you go to the moment you know in uh, in New York, it just it's a fucking zoo. Yeah, you can't you can't stand and appreciate because it's just too much going like, on. Yeah, you have to run through the place. <clears throat> but here you could actually just stand and stare at the painting for like ten minutes. Well, I think it was a longer. weekday, so it's probably why it was True. quiet. Um, but yeah, it was really nice. But the 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 painting, like his self portrait, for example, is just crazy. Yeah, it was pretty mesmerizing, like seeing all the it brush really strokes. Because when you see the brush strokes from, you know, like like close up, you're like, oh, it's just a bunch of lines, right? And then you step back a few steps and it's like this super ultra real picture of this guy. And you're like, how but is it that you can get such a strong, um, you know, graphic gesture with your brush and still like get so much of, of the image coming out? It was pretty impressive. It's interesting because it feels that with this particular painting and a lot of his work, right, there's a lot of brush strokes. And so you think that because there's so many brush strokes and a, and a really like intense variety of color, that one of these brush strokes could be off by a little bit and like it wouldn't make a difference to the painting, right? Because there's just so much going on. Um, in a similar way, if you look at... Um, uh, I don't know. Let's say Jackson Paul's work. If if one of the 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 uh, squiggles, the uh, what do you call Drip. it, drips, was off by half an inch, does that really make a difference with the mating? I don't know. Probably not. But with his Van Gogh's work, and a lot of artists who are just as good as him, it's like, but it couldn't be off, right? So that's the interesting thing to me is that when I see the painting, in my it feels to me like everything is happening in a very instinctive way, almost almost spontaneous, right? But there's not a lot of calculating, like active, sub, uh, active conscious calculating. And yet in the end, I don't think you could move anything. About, it's like it's perfect. Like it's, it's somehow it's crystallized and it's perfect despite it being a result of probably a process where, again, he's not mathematically calculating yeah. where things should go. Yeah. And I do wish that architecture, I think like architecture at its peak is sort of like that. You feel like you've captured a moment in a process and it feels fixed and crystallized and perfect, but it also feels like it came from uh, a more natural or human way of doing things. And I think a lot of times for architects, we get too, we get too mathematical. You know, square feet, program, align this, align that, and then setbacks. And it's partly to do with the nature of the work, of short. And then the structure, and then, oh, that has to align to there, and then we want this line to carry. Like, everything has to be neat, nice and neat and tight. And you lose, and and you grids. lose the, the main aspect of it. But it's like, do we, though? Right? Because, yeah. like, Corbusier's work, that's the, one of the reasons why I've always liked his work, is that it's it's very loose, you know? I wouldn't compare it to Van Gogh at all. Could probably shift a few things around. It wouldn't make a difference in some of his work, Corbusier's. But still, there's like a kind of 
not not a casual. But it probably but takes maturity too, and and practice, you know, could to be. get to that. But this is also what I'm saying. Like <laughs> when I see nice buildings that are ultra simplistic, right? I'm like, yeah, that's cool, but you're kind of choosing to take the safe path. Like, yeah, one giant oh, yeah, bar yeah. project is nice and sleek and looks great with the lighting and whatnot, but not much there, really. You know. Well, and I think is. It, the more complex something is, or so the harder it is to judge it. You know, mm. the simplest and the the purest it is, less room for error, and the more the higher the expectation is. I feel like. Mm, that's interesting. You know, like for example, the the Pavillon Le Corbusier that we saw, it's so expressive and so complex that you could cr- criticize the the complexity of it, mm-hmm. but you can't really get to criticize every single detail because there's so many of them right it's like where do you even start Mm -hmm. but if you look at i don't know the calatrava building let's say because it's a little bit more modern and and minimal Mm -hmm. there is only like five things that make the building so it's much more easy to uh, to criticize i never thought about it that way so if you don't want critics on your buildings just make it very complex (laughs) I, I i mean there is the 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 fact that doing something that is minimal at a high level is really difficult to do. That's one of the common misconceptions, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. But still, I don't know. The 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 intensity of these paintings that we saw is something that is just it's so impressive. And then you turn to another room and there's some like contemporary artist from the last thirty years and they have uh, how makes I don't know like uh, something simple like there's an egg that's been cracked. I'm like, all right, cool, dude. You know, or a maybe, urinal on a wall. I'm like, yeah, may- you're making a statement, but fuck, man, like this guy. Okay, Van Gogh is Van Gogh, so it's an unfair kind of example. But like, there's Van. Gogh, like, look, look at like the intensity and the skill and the craft of the work. You know, don't tell me that putting a urinal on a wall isn't anywhere close to it, and it, maybe you shouldn't be comparing the two. But that's just, that's the feeling I have, right? Like, there's the complexity and depth to the work. The same thing with Corbusier versus. I don't know. Well, name, name I mean, they're different genre in a way. It's yeah. unfair to you to yeah. you know to to compare them because you know what statement or opinion is Van Gogh doing with his auto portrait by, by except just making an image of himself? Like you could criticize the fact that his message is kind of well because it's just a reflection of himself. Where maybe Duchamp is actually provoking reaction and and you know creating a whole other thing so there's kind of like different ways and, and scales you can you can um i i understand that there, there, there's there's the the intent of the message as as a big part of whether and uh, how you critique something or think about something but the thing that has always bothered me and i think it always will is when i see a work of anything art architecture or something else and it's a one-liner that's my beef also with, frankly, a lot of the work that Heatherwick does. It's a one-liner. And yeah. I've talked about this with many architects off-air who probably would never say this on-air. They feel the same way. They're like, yeah, it's a second-year student's work. That's what I call it. They're like, yeah, you've, you've described it perfectly. It's like you took a second-year student who just learned Rhino and did a one-liner project with some basic bullion well, whatever it's a, shapes. It's a, it's a marketing pitch, you know. <clears throat> but so anyway... <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting but in what a- you're saying too, I think, is also the maybe the level of of commitment and personal commitment into the things that you do, right? I mean, there is a lot of intensity that is being produced by the person who creates, you know, the object or the art piece that they're creating, and how much they are putting themselves into the work that they do. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, you know, seeing Van Gogh's painting, like you could imagine the number of hours he probably spent working on that. Looking at Corbus building, you could imagine how, how many thoughts and how many things went through his head to get to that point, right? So you could kind of quantify, the, the again, the amount of work, research, brain power, personal investment that went into those pieces. And you could see that in the end, final product, Versus maybe the one-liner, where it could just have been, uh, I woke up with a great idea, and this is it. Yeah. You know. Um, the thing I, that also bothers me with the one-liners is that you know, you do it, and let's say you get press, and let's imagine also that the statement you're making is a valid one, and it's timely, and it's important, and has an impact, and all that great stuff. Um, but then that your main uh, way of expressing your ideas is through uh, work that is very shallow in terms of their execution and craft. Uh, that just, to me, it, it's like 
it's sort of like you're there you've developed a bit of um an ego and a presence and you think you have great importance but it's not really built on any true skill and that's the thing that bothers me yeah bothers me and that's coming from someone who i've i tend to value very highly craftsmanship of of whatever it is thing that, that we're talking about um it just i i, I it makes my head um shake it also maybe is coming from a point of of you know as a practicing architect i know architects who know their craft very well i know architects who don't know fuck all or designers who pretend to be architects and those are the people getting awarded projects and no. it's shit no. i'm like yeah but they don't actually know their craft it's all a lie right and i i don't know to me they're all related all these things no, 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 uh, i could see that you know i would be curious to know because you know i keep thinking about the corby pavilion and i'm like this is such a fantastic piece can we can we really just make more of those like fun expressive building there is something that's kind of like taboo about buildings being expressive of anything or building having personalities right because maybe it goes back to like trends and maybe being too much on how they look and not very much about like how they perform or like you know having to choose a side or one or the other mm. right but i would be very curious to know because i know a lot of architects love corby's work yeah because of everything or the theory and like the personality and like everything that goes kind of like be, be, beyond well, just the architecture dick, but yeah. <laughs> uh, no but kind of like this genius tortured crazy person right right, right? right, right. um but I wonder from people who are not architects, basically everyone else in the world, like, how do they see his work? And and how much, <laughs> yeah. let's say, of the, the normal people or like general public would like to have a building like that or, how, or live in a building like that? You know, I think that's... Most wouldn't. And I don't... That's and what I, I would I, assume. Yeah. But again, who knows, right? Well, I think... Well, but that, that, that's an interesting question too, because let's say that this um, that type of architecture was made more accessible and it was offered more often and just more prevalent. Would more people want it because that becomes closer to the status quo? I think that would take place for sure. That shift. Um, so I, I don't know. It, it's a good question. That reminded me when I was in architecture school. I think it was a first year or something. Um, and you're in school with a bunch of students and a lot of students don't know anything about architecture as did I really, but I did know about Corbusier's, uh, uh, Grand Champ chapel at that time. I knew about it. I've seen it before. And just from photo, I hadn't visited it at that point in time in person, but I knew that it was exquisite. There was something captivating about it. Couldn't express <laughs> it, but I knew there was something very interesting. Right. And I remember is showing it to one of my classmates um, as you know, we're talking about architecture and stuff. I'm like, yeah, take a look at this. And he looks at it and he goes, ew, I don't like that. It just looks kind of, and he used some word that was very contemporary, like slang, like not icky, like something that, that, the something, um, where that kind of critique only applies if you're concerned with the f frame of mind being relative to these next two years of my existence, you know, like trends kind of. I remember I was so annoyed, but I'm like, dude, shut up. Like, like if you're going to make a critique, then at least try to be more receptive. I'm like, and he knew this was not a random building. I'm like, you know, this is by Corbusi. And everyone knows at least that name at this point in time in first year. And you're just rejecting because it even it's kind of like, it looks kind of like weird. Like, what what kind of critique is that? But that's the similar kind of view a lot of the general public, maybe I mean, not all. It's a all, pretty weird building. <laughs> but it is a weird building. But a lot of the general public who are uneducated, and frankly, I don't concern myself with those assholes and nitwits. They can go fuck themselves for all I care. <laughs> no, but really, because I think they're, I, that sounds harsh, obviously, and I'm saying that just to be somewhat humorous, but also not. I think that's the mentality you have to take when you're creating work. Architecture is not just art. We have responsibilities and social responsibilities to everyone else and the client and all that stuff. True. But there, there's there's that mentality you kind of have to have in order for you to produce anything that I think is of true value to everyone else and yourself. You you kind of need to, in, in some ways, in some moments, for sure, just not care about what is going to be acceptable to other people and just do what you feel is, is most right. 
And honestly, that's not to say that, that you should just be let your ego r- run wildly and not care about anyone else. Um, but but doing that at, at moments in the process, let's say, it's a really difficult thing to do, yeah. um, given the constraints of architecture. But anyway, so Van Gogh's work blew my mind. Uh, it was phenomenal. And I, I, this might have been the first time I was able to be in a museum and see his work and these other folks' uh, work and just kind of sit with it. And it was really, really cool. Yeah. yeah. It was really good. Should we talk about the food? <laughs> so what do you think of the breakfast? Food. So we were only there for a week, but it seemed to be that at the hotels we stayed at, the breakfast always consisted of fresh fruit, some kind of bread, like a fresh loaf of bread, I few like, slice off. I feel like they had, has, they had, uh, yeah. I feel like they had kind of like the two types of breakfast you could expect, like the sweet or the savory. But it happened at the same time, though. Yeah, but you could go one route or the other. You okay, so let me finish content. the food list. So you had the the bread that you'd slice. On the bread, you would put jam or Nutella. And then you would have um, yogurt and juice, water, and cold cuts. Like cold slices, like deli meat sort of was what we would call it, yeah, I guess. Yeah, like but ham and, and all the Salami or maybe salami. something like that. They also had bacon and eggs in some places. Well, the bacon and eggs was one place, and I think they only did that because it was a nicer hotel, and they knew that they had a lot of Western, you know, visitors probably. But I don't think bacon and eggs was part of the standard. But do you think bacon and eggs was part of the standard Swiss breakfast? I don't think so. I think it's the other stuff I was describing. Yeah, yeah, Um, yeah. They had Nutella in every place, man. Those little packets. I was like. Oh, yeah, let's have Nutella every morning. <laughs> Can get judged because that's what people eat here in the morning. So, you know, I got to be part of the culture. But they, it's interesting. They also had the juice and they had the orange juice and they had the multivitamin juice. Yeah, which I never had. What oh, is I that? I love multivitamin juice. It's just a different, like... different fruit juice. Okay. So it makes better. It's, oh, it's really good. I was pretty happy with that. Um, yeah, no, the breakfast were, were pretty good. I have to say, I was a little bit worried that it would just be like ham and cheese. I was like, I don't know how I feel about that in the morning. I have no problem but, with it. Uh, I, I, I did, oh, they had cheese in the in the morning too, like prop, like, like slices of cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so I make myself a little cheese and ham croissant sandwich in the morning for breakfast. Yeah, it's great. Again, though, the fiber that's the I issue. Say, <laughs> the thing though is that fruit and vegetables doesn't seem to be a top priority over there. They had a lot of apples. Yeah, but it's kind of like the decor fruit that goes in the basket anywhere you go. Like it's not that's true. You know, really. Uh, well, like I ate the decor food. fruit because I was in need of fiber. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't care if this is plastic. I'm gonna eat this. <laughs> but the the first region we were in was the the region of apples or something. So we had some a lot of apple cider. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's really good. That was really good cider. So yeah. in the United States, we have Martinelli's. No, but that's just sugar. Right. <laughs> and growing up as a kid, when you, at least for me, I don't know. During the holidays, you have like. Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas Eve dinner with the family. There's like the classic, you know, ham. My family's very American, hardly Chinese. Uh, but there's rice. That's about it as far as the Chinese side. But other than that, there's ham. Um, and, they, you know, parents have wine and the kids always have Martinelli's. That was a thing. I love Martinelli's as a kid. Now that I'm older, it's fucking disgusting. <laughs> it's like 80 we grams have, of We have sugar. something called champomy in French. Ch- okay. Which is like Champagne similar. of pear? No, of, of, of champomy. It's like... Well, you have apple cider in France, but you have like the one that's um, like hard cider and one that's more like soft cider. And one is more bitter than the other. And I think the percentage of alcohol is a little bit different. Yeah. But kids have the champomy, which is the non-alcoholic version of cider, yeah. of hard cider. Um, I, I don't think it's as disgusting as Martinez. It's actually pretty good. It's like it's like apple juice with like some bubbles. Yeah. Martinelli is, is like it's, sugar water with yeah. bubbles. It's, yeah. It's, wa- it's sugar with some other stuff added to it to make yeah, it liquid. It's, it's weird. Somehow the Martinelli's company has figured out how to liquefy sugar without adding any <laughs> water to it. <laughs> uh, but the apple cider we had it was really clean. in Switzerland yeah. was really good. Really nice. Um, but making our way through, we visited... What were some of the other towns we visited on our own after the, the Skyframe? So after the Skyframe tour, we went, went on Lucerne. our own. We did uh, Lucerne or Luzerne, depending yeah. on how you say it, uh, which is just like an hour away or so, south of Zurich. Uh, very nice town. We actually enjoyed this place quite a bit. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we saw Jean Nouvel building that was kind of more of a, I think, an event center. Uh, it sounded <laughs> like with a giant cantilever. So again, if you hop on Instagram, you'll see some videos of this gigantic cantilever. As you can expect, very Jean Nouvel type of building, like the materials, the details, uh, the moves, very him. I thought it was all right. Um, not the most beautiful building, but there's some... Yeah, you know, I would agree with that thing. statement, right? It's a little bit clunky. It's, it's yeah. kind of a, a bit too much going on, um, to it's be honest. It's also giant, which might not have been his... Um, I mean, I'm sure the program you know, was asking was, for yeah. all of that. It was a giant underground parking where, is, where we parked. It's right next to a train station. So that's probably why we're so scared. But of just in the, in the, this, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's massive. It's, it's massive on the water. And on the other side of where that building is located, it's more of the old town of, of Lucerne. Yeah. Uh, which was very pleasant, very pedestrian. There wasn't a lot of cars along the water. You kind of like have a very long uh, historical wooden bridge that you can walk through. Amazing. Um, that was pretty cool. Built in like the 1700s am- or something. It's, it's amazing all these European cities and towns, right? They all are very pedestrian friendly. A lot of cobblestones. The scale and proportions of the streets to buildings is a certain um, relationship so that they feel good. And they're always, they, a lot of them have a really nice relationship to the waterfront because obviously back in the day that was your source of life is this stream or lake or body of water so you're next to it for whatever reason i don't know how many places in the united states and let's say around the world but let's say the united states have what could be a nice body of water and a huge amenity and feature of that city but next to it instead of having buildings and cafes and plazas you have a fucking freeway i know like i, I would like to know from some urbanists out there how many uh, waterfront edges are um, actually usable as let's call it a, an amenity versus being eaten up by cars. Yeah. Like, what is that ratio? I bet it's at least fifty-fifty, or if not, more in favor of the vehicles, which is a travesty. You know, it's 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 which is actually interesting because I think in like you know like um, in in most probably European cities, the water was actually a, a way of transportation of goods right back in the day. So it was related to transportation and probably a lot of the axes along the water that were built were used for transportation as well. But somehow they retain, you know, the charm and the pedestrianness of those spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, the water in Switzerland too is also like the cleanest, purest water. It looked like see. Gatorade. <laughs> it looked like Gatorade. It was like <laughs> bright blue. Uh, yeah. It was crazy because, you know, it all comes from the glaciers and the mountains and all that. So it's just like mountain water running Everywhere, and um, you know, it sounds like it smells like it sounds like it smelled bad at all. It actually didn't smell like anything there. Yeah, because um, it's you know, it's just lake water. Just an odd thing, because from an urban planning standpoint, all, all these towns they feel great to be in, and maybe some of the the corridors get a little bit too narrow. But in general, they feel great. You have all these plazas. You know, every five hundred feet, there's a plaza where there's a market. That's we saw a lot of markets that just happened to be going on when we were there. And there's like little concerts. Like it's perfect, huh. and it's it's sort of like well, this was built how many centuries ago? Like a lot, this long was just figured ago. out a while ago. We certainly have the construction means and methods to build superior buildings, but in the same that achieve the same kind of effect. I don't know why we don't. Do it. No, it's, I know. It's, it's, the interesting thing too in the few of the cities we went to in Switzerland is that they they preserved the, the historical downtown, but they also provided parking. There's a lot of underground public yep. parking where yep. you just put your car there and then you could just spend the whole and day you on walk. your feet walking yeah. around. Um, so yeah, I think we could do better. I did enjoy the amount of walking. The first few days of, from jet lag was brutal. Not gonna lie. But we did like 16, 20, almost 30,000 steps. I felt great. I'm like, this is this is pro- probably what I should be doing every day is walking about 20,000 steps to just stay somewhat healthy, which I don't do <laughs> anymore. Well, the thing is, where would you go <laughs> for so many steps? I don't know. We had fondue a couple of times, too. That was nice. You, had, you insisted on the fondue. You have to have fondue when you go to a Swiss or like the French mountains. Like, you cannot not have fondue. There is one place you should have it. It's there. And actually, I think someone commented on Instagram that we're barbarians because we had fondue in June, which fondue <laughs> is typically more of a winter dish. Yeah, yeah that's fair. I was like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I have it in August if I needed yeah. to. The thing I didn't realize about Switzerland, 
um, was everything, <laughs> but that they don't have. <laughs> there's not like a Swiss language. Like England has English, well, Spanish, Swiss German. Yeah, I know, but so there's three or four national languages for this tiny country, and the na and the language that's spoken depends on kind of what side of the country you're on and what it's bordering. So when you're near the German side, which we were at the beginning of the trip, they speak Swiss German, which is a version i don't know if it's considered a dialect but it's a version of german that's german but not one that germans can understand and if you go to the italian side they speak i guess it'd be considered swiss italian or italian and the french side is french so it's like the fourth language of switzerland is romansh is that their like in their own language do they have their own language no it's just a so this is a map that shows like which language are spoken where in Roman, she is German. just like a couple areas where people speak that. Wow. It's, it's crazy, it's, right? It's odd. And not in a bad way, but it's odd that you'd have a country that doesn't have its own. Roman is a gallo language. We don't even have our language. Own language. What am I saying? We're American <laughs> speaking English. But there's not one unifying language. You know, it's just kind of like, yeah, well, we're closer to that side, so I guess we'll speak that language, but we're part of the same country. The. German portion of Switzerland that we saw, very clean, very quiet, very calm for the most part. The Italian side, a little different. bit different. <laughs> a little bit different. In what ways, Marina? Uh, Grungier. More passion. <laughs> Well, we didn't spend a whole lot in the time in the Italian um, side because we just stopped in Locarno and then we actually hopped over to Italy. So the Italian side is it Italian, Italian side. Yeah. Um, but Locarno, for example, was, yeah, it was a bit more messier, looser, looser. you know, um, less organized, less, you know, tight, tight and tidy. Yeah. Um, but it was good, too. Talking about food, <clears throat> we were in this very small town in Italy called Domodossola, right? That's the one Domodossola, you mentioned. yeah. Dossola, right. Small, small town, there for one night. We need to find food, so we're like, let's go to dinner somewhere. Uh, we weren't super hungry, but you got to eat. So <clears throat> we lo were looking we're up the- We were not super hungry. <laughs> the, no, we weren't, because we had gelato, because <laughs> we got to have gelato. Um, the eight and a half by 11 piece of paper- that's printed that has recommendations of places to eat, right? Look up one of them. A Michelin star restaurant. Well, let's just take a look just to see for fun. And then I look at the menu prices. Quite affordable, this Michelin star restaurant. I did ask my parents about the price. I was like, is this like normal? And they're like, yeah, I mean, in France, you could go to a really good restaurant for that price. I was like, damn it. So I want to say, so we get there. It's a Michelin star restaurant. So the service was what you would expect, right? We sit down, and um, we decide. Well, I, I I figured in my mind. Well, the, the, the how, how much was it for like an entree? I don't remember. Like forty dollars or something. I think total for two, for the two entree and two appetizers we ordered was like one hundred and forty dollars plus two drinks. Plus two drinks. Plus two drinks. So that's very 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 <laughs> reasonable by American standards. Like when when by it, if New, someone by tells me California or or New York standard. <laughs> I mean an average it's fucking Chipotle costs you that much these days. But if if you go to a Michelin star restaurant, you know, in California, you expect it okay, we're talking about probably 200 300 dollars a per head, person. A head, yeah. You know, 400 bucks or whatever, right? So this is very reasonable and I also figure well this is a a Michelin star place. I've seen the bear. So uh, these proportions must be tiny ass proportions. I'm going to get like a <laughs> teaspoon for like the entree. So And Yelp is not really a thing in Europe as much as it is in the States. Right. So you can't really like do your homework before you go places. So I'm like, well, we're not hungry, but given the fact I'm going to get a teaspoon of, of gummy bears or whatever. Um, yeah, I'll get an, I'll get a, we'll each get an appetizer because that sounds cool. And we'll get an entree and then dessert. We don't need dessert because we had gelato. Um, and we're adults. And so, uh, and they're like, fine, I'll get a glass of wine. So they bring out this massive thing. Oh, no, they bring out um, a pre-appetizer that was yeah. compliments of the chef, which was small proportions, like, it's like, a few like bites. Th two or yeah. three bites, but good sized bites. And we're like, wow, this is nice. This is on the house. This is really cool. We eat that. Then they bring out a tray of bread. 
<laughs> a loaf of, a loaf of <laughs> homemade bread, <laughs> a, a stack loaf. of grissini, which are like those long sticks that um, sticks. Italians eat, you know. Um, yeah, but but it wasn't. Stack. There's only two of us at the center. It wait, wasn't wait, wait. like and handmade rosemary crackers, and that was filling up the center of the table. Yeah, and I'm so, like, oh my god. <laughs> And there was and, and there is two types of butter. There was like a pyramid of butter that was like handmade, like shaped in a really cool way, and then another type of butter that came on the other side. Yeah, and there wasn't like three of the little breadsticks, was, right? Which would be reasonable if if you're giving someone an entire loaf of bread. Maybe there's only two breadsticks. There, there's like twenty of these things. So, and w- again, we weren't super hungry when we went to dinner. No, so, so we. we we had a little bit, and I felt I just felt really bad, um, and I wanted to ask to take it to go, but we definitely did not need it because we were traveling and you know and crackers in the and car whatever is, else. You know, kind of so now I'm, I'm getting a little concerned. <laughs> then, then our yeah, go ahead. What? And then I was like, okay, this is the second free things they're giving <laughs> us. We were concerned because we're not really hungry, and I'm like, I'm not sure I can make it to the end of this dinner. Yeah. And then I was like. Did we check the price correctly? Like, are we missing a zero somewhere? Because why would they give us so much free stuff we didn't ask for, right? And then the our appetizers that we ordered arrive. I ordered a what is it? A frog raw, frog raw, frog raw. Frog raw. I don't know how what many ways. Frog raw. Wa frog Yeah, <laughs> don't have to make that face. I ordered frog <laughs> And uh, it turned out to be six versions of it. <laughs> <laughs> it shows up with this, east... with this. It was a tray. There was a box open with like four or five dishes. And I'm like, oh, my God, what did you order? <laughs> I ate all of it. But again, didn't need uh, to eat I have it. to say, it was a very quiet dinner because I think the two of us were just trying to make it to the end without, you know, being sick or feeling too full. I had ordered some sort of like egg souffle with asparagus and truffle. I, was, was, I have to say, it was good. It was probably not my favorite thing. Yeah. Uh, it was yeah. a little bit, yeah, not, not my favorite. Then the main courses arrived. Mine was a some kind of seafood thing. It was phenomenal. It was great. And then we got free dessert. <laughs> and then we're like, okay, you know, just, just a bill. Like, we're good. I, was, we I just asked wanna, for the bill. I'm like, the bill, no uh, dessert. You know, you know, just a bill. Like, we want to get out, basically go lay down. <laughs> That's what we want to be doing. Yeah. And they bring this pyramid, this wooden sculpted pyramid, this beautiful object, and this wooden box. And I'm like, what is this? <laughs> we didn't ask for it. I just want to leave. <laughs> and there is like little bites of ch- special chocolates and like candy things and whatever. And I'm like, okay, it's rude not to eat that. Like someone, you know, made it. Presentation is beautiful. Like I, I kind of feel bad. I was really not feeling good at that point. I was like, they better not bring me anything after this or I'm I'm really going to be sick, you know. Yeah. Uh, the chocolates were amazing, of course. The fruity things. The dessert was delicious. really good. So it was great. Um, but, so it was great. Totally worth So if you're ever in that town and you go to this place, uh, you can expect reasonable prices and... Don't have gelato <laughs> before dinner. Not yeah. necessary. I mean, even if we hadn't had that, that, that was like a lot of food. Yeah. Um, it wasn't as much food as at one time. We had this one place in Santa Barbara and it was a prefixed meal. That um, again. It was a tasting menu. A or tasting something, menu, right? and a lot of times the tasting menus are more expensive, but for the variety you get, is it's a good deal, and it seemed to be a good restaurant. And we're out, so we're like, yeah, let's let's try it. It was, and we a asked gro- the server. It's like, oh, you know, it's family style, so we're thinking, okay, small proportion. Yeah. We, we'll share a dish. Yeah. It wasn't that. <laughs> it was a grotesque amount it was, of food. We each got the dish, so yeah. instead of having one plate that you split in halves. We each got that plate, so it was like we had like f- five courses. Like no, it was, it was more. It was I want to say six or seven courses, but each of the courses could have <laughs> almost been enough for a meal, a, a, a whole meal. A, almost a full meal, or at least like a very full half at the, at least. And so halfway through, we just felt so gross. And the uh, there was a couple that sat down next to us afterwards. They ordered the same thing. They got two dishes in, and they're like, "Pack up the rest to go. We're done." And the two of us didn't, we weren't able to keep track of what was coming. So I was like, there's got, only got to be one well, more. Well, we couldn't just take it to go too because we were on a road trip. Yeah, so. that's true. But that was, I have never felt so disgusting and, and I've, I felt sick afterwards. I didn't, I didn't throw know, up, but know, I felt it, so full. I know. It, it's kind of, it's kind it's, of amazing how a, a food experience could go wrong. <laughs> with too much food? <laughs> with too much oh, of man, it. Oh man, it's so full. 
Um, anyway, burning through the trip. So we saw a bunch of other cool stuff. We went to this place called Interlochen. Um, we went on a, uh, a ravine, canyon. No, what is it? A gorge. gorge. A walk. Gorge hike. Yeah. Which, being a SoCal kid, just reminded me of the Matterhorn. Um, we took a, a car shuttle train. Yeah. Which oh yeah, n- had no idea what that was before. You actually bring your car on a train, sit in your car, and go through a whole mountain yeah. in the dark in a tunnel for twenty minutes. Long, um, yeah, twenty that was minutes. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's very different. The gorge was beautiful. You know, crystal clear. Well, not crystal clear. Like Arctic Gatorade clear. Ga- Gatorade Arctic flavor. You know, nice little walk. Um. Uh, we mostly just side saw. So there is one thing that happened is so we go to this town. What's what town is this? The where we had Spiet. the no no so yeah yes yeah, Spietz Spietz. So we go to this town Spietz, <laughs> which is a funny name, and we're walking around. Uh, beautiful. We need to get dinner, so we go down to this place to get dinner. We're gonna get pizza because I'm craving some pizza. We step into the restaurant again. It is so hot and stuffy and loud and filled with people. And it was tough enough to where I started sweating. As the guy's walking us toward our table, I'm starting to sweat. And people who are the guests, one woman's like wiping her face off with her napkin because it's so warm. And I said to the guy, and this is and this is facing a um, the, lake. the lake, right? So there's a beautiful body of water like right outside the restaurant and a, a lot of outdoor seating too. They had the a patio weather, on the water. Patio on the water. The This was before sunset. So it was nice and nice, nice out. It was maybe like mid sixties, high sixties degrees. Perfect. perfect weather. I said to the guy, "Can we sit outside?" He's like, "No, the outside's closed." And so I insist. I said, "But really, can we sit outside? Because it's really warm in here. We want to be by the water because obviously we're tourists. I want to see the beautiful Swiss mountains in the background with the snow, and not look at a bunch of people in a room and have it be really loud and sweaty." He's like, "No, it's closed." And it was not closed for maintenance. I think he didn't want his waiters to have to go out there. There was a few people sitting and eating out there, but I think he had decided <laughs> that his waiters probably was not worth their time going in and out. So we sat down for all of 10 seconds. We were like, no, we're not doing this. This is uncomfortable. So we got the pizza to go. Then we sat outside. We sat outside the restaurant on a on a, on a a bench along the water and just ha- sat outside and had like a little picnic. And it was beautiful out and there was a fucking rainbow that appeared across the swiss mountains where there was ice caps and there was a rainbow and then the sun sets and you have golden light hitting all of these um not the chateaus but the, the chalets this historic chalets and the mountainside and the lake and then the trees and no one inside of this fucking restaurant is seeing this because they're all forced to be inside with the, these other sweaty bodies it was so absurd I know, it, was pretty ridiculous. it made no sense they were very snooty at that restaurant, I'll be completely honest, because I went back in to get a, a bottle of sparkling water because we needed something to drink. And um, they were just like, I'm like, yeah, give me some, sell me a bottle of water. I'll, I'll pay the six, seven, whatever francs it is, which is ridiculous, but I don't care. Just give it to me. So despite it being a nice evening outside, I was quite annoyed with those people inside. By the way, too. The pizza was okay. Pizza was okay. Yeah. It was supposed to be like the best pizza in town, whatever. It was okay. It, it was that. It was good. It was fine. I would say. I wouldn't say it was fine, but it wasn't like anything amazing. So it wasn't much better than the Trader Joe's pizza. <laughs> whatever kind of snootiness these people had in the small town, like get over yourselves. Yeah. Also, but the view was pretty incredible. Yeah, I mean, I was. <laughs> we were thinking like we should just go back in the restaurant and tell everyone you should be eating outside. Vacate, like, vacate, get out. You're missing out. It's just the whole their their service was just not. Not on point. You know, yeah. like they gave me the pizza. So I'm standing there with this hot pizza. I'm like, okay, uh, do you want me to pay? So I'm standing there. I said, I need to pay. Oh, yeah. The guy walks away. I'm like, okay, I'm offering to pay you now. What the fuck is this, man? Get, get, get. So then it took like another five minutes for them to find someone so I could so I could pay for my food. Just so like, what is this customer service? Are we almost done here? This recording's going to last 10 hours. Well, I we might have to do a part two. No, we're almost here at the end. It's only been an hour and a half. But that's basically the most of the trip. And then finally, we went to Bern, which is the capital of Switzerland, which was nice. Um, hung out there, another historic town. 
kind of what you would expect from a historic town. But just Lots of nice. pavers. It's interesting talking about yeah. pavers. There is a few towns, I think it was more toward Italy, yeah. where they actually used the pebbles, you know, the river pebbles, mm -hmm. and used that as pavers. So it wasn't even flat. It was like, you know... You're walking uh, like, on pebbles. Like, like, like com convex. Yeah. So you were actually, I mean, if, if you had like light shoes, you would actually feel the curve of the pavers as you were walking. Extremely painful on the feet. Well, you were wearing a Birkenstock, so you felt... Yeah, but, well, I was wearing some other crappy shoes the other days, but um, but it's kind of like, it's amazing that they would choose to do it that way. I, mean, I guess it's a natural resource. You could just grab the pebbles and like stick them in there. Um, pretty interesting. As opposed to putting them face... As opposed to have like the square cobblestones. Hmm. Or like sp true. split them in half and because just if put you them can like build the bu yeah. I don't flat know. face up or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, I had my shoes on. So it didn't bother me. <laughs> you had your hiking shoes on, <laughs> yeah, so it yeah, didn't matter yeah. for you. But, uh, you know, just a heads up. Yeah. Um, Bern was pretty cool. Really big historical downtown. Very pedestrian. Lots happening. Um... Uh, You know, like I think we saw like two farmers market that mm -hmm. that day. It was a, a weekend, so it was a bit more busy. But a lot of like little you know spots to sit and drink and eat and, and stuff like that. Um, very pleasant bridges too, lots of bridges. And then we made our way to the the Paul Klee Museum uh, by Renzo Piano. That was like a few minutes away. That looked kind of like ribbons in the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, You know, we left our, our thoughts on that on Instagram, too. You can check out the videos and, and kind of like see what that looks like. Yeah, we did actually talk about the architecture a little bit more in those videos compared to the others that were just kind of just random fun things. But, yeah, my opinions of it are either stated or suggested in the videos. And then we went back to Zurich because that's where we had to fly out from. Mm -hmm. So decided to go and explore the more historical parts of Zurich because we had done the architecture tour, which was more on the newer neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. The historical part, I have to say, if you only have a short amount of time in Zurich, don't bother with the new modern buildings. They're not yeah. that great. Go to like the older part of, yeah. of Zurich. It was really, really cool. Uh, there is some streets too where it's not all flat, so it kind of like goes up and down. It's very pedestrian friendly, lots of like small streets and alleyways and meandering and, and things like that. Uh, we walked through like an impromptu concert, two farmers market, I mean, all kinds of stuff. We had some There's more There's an fondue. acrobat performing, doing some what I mean, this is the thing when you have a city and it's the, f it has to do with the events too, but it's just the urban fabric. When you have yeah. pedestrian streets that wind around and you have plazas that provide relief where you can have seating or perform it like it's just this is what happens it's not rocket science and it's been existing forever so yeah. this is like i don't know why we don't we had the best gelato yeah there is this place called tendici i think and they have a place in 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 lucerne and zurich it was the cleanest gelato we've ever had like mm -hmm. it was so flavorful was pretty delicious and then of course we had to have more fondue before we left so <laughs> we went for around two uh <laughs> yeah it was us and a bunch of asian tourists you were really annoyed at that we get in the restaurant and there was like we sat in the quiet half of the restaurant the other half was like packed with tourists all asian and you were not happy about that <laughs> no because the, 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 these the, a lot of them were like large tour groups and they were just super loud and one of them was having some kind of party and they were in a closed Or a separate room, and it's fine. Do it. It's you have a private event, you've you've taken the space to whatever you want. But I just find it to be uh, just too obnoxious. Like, don't be so loud. Don't scream across the table. You know, the, the private event, like, do whatever you want. But other, like, you're like you don't need to be so loud when you speak. It's, it's just like it's too much. Like I'm sitting right here, like across, from, like not across, from, but like near you. You don't need to do that. Like. I'm sitting across from somebody. I'm talking to them. I'm not shouting. They can hear me just fine. Like, just tone it down, man. You know? And I don't know. It's like they all, they're they always wearing, like, the most random stuff. It's hard on the eyes. I'm like, just wear something. I don't... I'm not huge at, like, everyone wearing beige all the time. But just, just I don't know, choose some colors that remotely have sense to do with each other. <laughs> You're mixing Puma, Nike, Adidas, and Louis Vuitton. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, it's just hard to look at. And, like, this is brutal. Like, Maybe it's so sponsored. Maybe they've been sponsored by brands and they're just wearing... That's the thing the I brands. hate, too, just in general. When people buy a Louis Vuitton hat 
or whatever, and they pair that with nothing else that makes any sense. I'm like, that, that, that's not how it works, yeah. right? You're just obsessed with the brands. You have you have no sense of style at all. It drives me nuts. <laughs> it's, it's, don't do that. I don't care about the ethnicity, but just like stop doing that. It's 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 you're just a, it's you're just disrespect just a cons- for the creation. For the well, it is. You're just the- a consumerist, right? Who uh, who has no idea uh, like the value of the, the the design of anything, and you're doing it for status, and it's just disgusting. And you're loud, so no, I don't want to be near you. You and everyone else in your group, we all dress the same. Same chaos going on over there. Like this is Switzerland, <laughs> like. We gotta you know, maintain, you know, an acceptable level of public behavior for the Swiss. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, so no. what did you think of the fondue number one versus number two? Um, I'm curious. Number two felt to be a higher quality than number one, but I had it had been forever since I have had fondue. Maybe it's the first. I don't remember the last time I had it. Like I was at, in a, at, at a restaurant, though. Oh. Um, so I was surprised by how pungent the wine uh, portion of it comes across. The second one was much stronger flavor. But uh, I, yeah, it was good. I mean, you know, it's bread and cheese. Again, it's, it's So hard. there is one thing I feel like restaurants who sell fondue should explain to tourists yeah. on how you're supposed to dip your bread and eat it. Okay. Yeah. Because I was observing tourists in the second restaurant we went to and they were, you know, you have your, your fondue stick you have your little square of bread, you 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 know, you, you put at the end of your stick. And people were just dipping it in and out. Okay. And I'm like, <laughs> like, this is not how you do it properly. You put it in and you kind of like stir it around the pot to make sure that every single millimeter of that piece of bread is covered in cheese, right? Again, okay. you want maximum coverage, efficiency <laughs> of the piece of bread. Use the piece of bread as the vessel to carry as much cheese out of that pot as you can. That's the deal, right? And then when you take it out, if you just hold it and wait for it to cool down, you're just going to lose the cheese you just grabbed, mm-hmm. right? So you have to keep rotating the stick so the cheese cools down but stays on the piece of bread oh my God, how many people were doing it wrong in that restaurant? And I'm like, they should, you know, on the menu, they should have a little diagram, like step one, step two, step three, mm-hmm. or like a little video tutorial. Like, I feel like... I, I think you, 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 you maybe take this like a little too seriously. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, it would... But if you don't I, want but a piece of saying... bread that's half covered in cheese, it's disgusting. You can taste the bread. The point is not to know there is bread under there. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I never thought of it that way. But... It, it is. It, it makes sense that it would occur, but they they have proportioned almost I know, perfectly uh, the I amount know. of cheese to bread. Like when you're doing it, you think like I'm going to have too much cheese. When you're doing or it I'm at home, you bread. always have like yeah, more yeah. or less. Yeah. But they they have it down to a science because it's all they do. But it's like the perfect. But if you don't dip it the way you're describing, which seems like also common sense to me, to be honest, uh, uh, then you would have a surplus of cheese, which is maybe not a bad thing. And then you have to like scratch the pot at the bottom to, to get, get the, the burnt cheese, you know, the burnt cheese, the toasted cheese. Yeah. So I think that's pretty much it. And then the flight back was long, super long, super, super, super long. Plenty of annoying people on the airplane, as usual. People who don't know how to behave in airplanes. It always amazes me. It always amazes me that they're around me also. <laughs> fucking sit somewhere else. Like, how did I sit in <laughs> I front of or behind of someone who doesn't know how to behave in public? Get back to LAX. Quickly reminded of the shit show that LA is through LAX. You fly back to LAX or JFK in New York, right? <laughs> LA, New York, big important cities in the world. Shitty airports. And um, then got sick for three days. So that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then got me sick for two weeks. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was a good trip. But then the jet lag works good on the way back. First of all, because we didn't do an, an, a red eye, so we get back on some sort of like decent time. And then you just what happens? You just wake up a little bit earlier than usual, mm-hmm. which is kind of nice because you never really want to do that, mm-hmm. you know. So I actually like the the jet lag on the way back. I agree. I feel like I'm getting, uh, I'm actually getting back in track, but also a little bit ahead, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, all in all, good trip? All in all, good trip. A beautiful place. I would say 
before we you know we got invited to to go for the tour uh switzerland i had been before more on the french side because i have some family there but it's never been a place where i would have wanted to go back or or put on my travel list yeah uh mostly because i think i'm more interested in very different culture to to visit a very different culture sure. rather than like you know contemporary um neighboring uh, places but it was nice and and relaxing and civilized and and charming <laughs> so Very I would civilized. say if you make it to Europe and you're hopping around to different countries, I would probably recommend making a stop to Switzerland because there is some really beautiful landscape yeah. uh, and seeing again like those lakes everywhere, like so clear, so clean. And if you're into chocolate, it's a good place to be. So I just remembered <clears throat> when we were at the Paul Klee Museum, the um, <laughs> little cafe, you ordered oh. <laughs> an iced chai tea. So because they know, had it, chai it, tea, yeah. So it was. It was, it, we needed a beverage and kind of like to to rest because we had been walking quite a bit. And I see chai tea on the menu. I'm like, okay, well, do they have iced coffee? I'm just going to ask if they could make it an iced chai. This was probably the first time in the trip I saw somebody so confused by what I was saying. And I'm like, speaking English, she's speaking English. I think we understand each other. She understood the words. But she looked at me so puzzled, like, yeah. what was I asking? And I'm like, can you make it iced? And she looks at me. She's like, "No," <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, "Wait a minute! I'm but not, they, but, I'm not asking so, for a milkshake here, okay? I'm just asking that you put yeah, ice cube yeah, yeah. into a drink. You're making other ice drinks, so that means they you have served ice. iced coffee. They had iced coffee on the menu, and she was very, very perplexed by what I was, by what I was asking, and she eventually did it." So she was behind the counter, like preparing it, you know, making the tea in a teacup with the the chai tea. Then she grabbed a plastic cup, I think, of ice, fills it up with ice, and I'm like, okay, perfect. I could just pour in the plastic cup. She chose to pour the ice in the teacup, which I'm like, well, if you look at the ratio of an ice drink and a <laughs> beverage, you probably want mostly ice than warm water. That's why she was confused, though. She was like, how is this going to work? But common sense would dictate you don't you don't do that. You use a different ratio. So it was the had, worst chai latte a, I've ever had. <laughs> yeah. It was very odd. It I was mean, like <clears throat> look, look warm chai latte. I mean, maybe awful. their iced coffee is made beforehand, cooled, and they just have to add you know ice to it. So fine, but it doesn't take a scientist to figure out that it, you you make the tea. It's hot, right? And then you have to add a lot of ice to cool it down, or you f figure out some other. You let it sit for a little bit, maybe, and then you add the ice. But it was like. You could see her like literally take the hot tea that was made and be like, "Uh, I guess I'm gonna grab two ice cubes and put it in the hot tea." Is is this what you mean? <laughs> and we no, had, that's not what and, I mean. And <laughs> we had fine. gone Thanks to a, a cafe in Zurich where we had ice matcha. Yeah, but that's also you know. It, I mean, it was more of an urban cafe yeah. thing where they're probably more in tune with stuff. But I'm like, okay, you're in a museum. Like, you should know. <laughs> Um, you know, and then I try to pay with euros, and they're like, "Oh, we don't take euros." I'm like, I'm "Like really?" Like, yeah, they take francs. To take euros anywhere else that we went to, I'm like, "Okay." Oh, like, anywhere else? In, yeah, in, in, it was fine. In, I mean, oh, they, they're like, that. you know, you, you're a country that chooses not to be part of Europe, but you're in the middle of it. Well, you're probably going to have to deal with euros at some point in your life. So, <laughs> at you some know. point, but not now, not yet. So yeah, so if you do go to the Polkri Museum at the cafe and you want to try. Just ask for a chai tea and a separate cup of ice, and do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. The Paul Klee Museum. Let's uh, let's do an outro then. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this after our episode. If you like what we do, please rate the show, subscribe. We're on um, pretty much any podcast platform: iTunes, yeah. Spotify, YouTube. Uh, we have the website secondstudiopod.com. We're also on Instagram, Second Studio Pod. You can follow us, watch our trip photos and videos, and 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 you know, add some of the comments. I do wonder and if like people who subscribe to Instagram because our Instagram content is pretty specific. It's like educational, architectural stuff. But on the show, as listeners know, we do have these after-hour conversations. So the show, as a podcast, is a mixture between just conversations and architecture things. But and and the videos we we did during the trip were 
like 80% just us talking about random stuff and not really doing an intense architectural critique. So I don't know if followers are like, what is this? There's what? a few people who are like, well, I dare you tell Renzo Piano to his face about the Pokemon. I don't give a fuck. Think. Of course, it's Renzo like, Piano. Why would he care? He's I'm, like about to retire and he's successful. What does he care? Well, and I, he knows that this know, building's not his best one. Like, come on. I mean, I would just get, put me in touch with him <clears> and I would let him know. <laughs> I don't think he speaks. Uh, does he speak English very well? Or is it I don't know Europeans, you know English is not really the forte. Well, that's what they, that's what they all say, and then you say stuff, and they they, they I, reply although in the English. The trend has been changing, so I might have to stop saying that because <laughs> yeah. it might not be true anymore. Yeah. Um, I can mumble in Italian and tell him it's <laughs> shit. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so you can find us on all of those platforms. We also have the hotline, 213-222-6950. If you want to send us some guest suggestions, some topic that you want us to mm-hmm. talk about or anything else you want to share with us, that's one of the best ways to contact us. And uh, that's it. We have a lot more coming up. So stay tuned. Share share the podcast with the people you love. And, uh, and the people you hate. And the people you hate. Yep. And everyone else. And that's it. Cool. Talk soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.